They're everywhere. Coast to coast like corporate crop circles. Toronto, Charlottetown, Prince Albert, Yellowknife. Why did this country plaster itself with logos visible from space? And how did another avoid this fate? This was me two months ago in New Zealand, taking a breather on a local playground. Why are playgrounds so much better here than in Canada? Have you noticed that? There was an obvious difference, but it wasn't always like this. When I left New Zealand a decade ago, playgrounds looked about the same as North America, but both countries had some pretty wild play spaces back in the day. Check out Ontario Place. It had an awesome play area where you could come with your whole family, seething with a thousand children simultaneously having the best day of their lives, banging on musical instruments, bouncing on airbags, with the audible joy of children constantly squealing across all footage. And sure, sometimes crawling under something would cause a bump, sometimes falling off would break a bone, and sometimes, as one playground inspector put it, Entanglement, head and neck entrapment, those two contribute to killing a lot of kids. Yeah, killing kids was a real killjoy, and as you would expect, something litigious this way came. Liability lawsuits piled up like the corpses of children at the bottom of a poorly designed slide. In New York, one lost finger fine alone amounted to $750,000. In California, a Burger King playground delivered a whopper $20 million payout. The value of injury or loss of life of children is so high because they have literally their whole lives ahead of them. So when you take that away, expect to pay. And it wasn't just in North America. After breaking the legs of three children in under a year, the notorious lighthouse slide in Wellington's Frank Kitts Park was demolished. But since its removal, journalists uncovered a slew of victims dating back to the early 90s. From beyond the grave, this Jimmy Savile of slides is now thought to have broken the legs of as many as 30 children. A safety tsunami swept the world. Merry-go-rounds, murdered, seesaws, slashed, flying foxes, Fuck Aww. off. It was for great replay cement. Weird pun. Concrete wood chips and sand became thicker and thicker rubber mats. Bolted together wood beams became modular square platforms. Crazy metal climbing structures were replaced by standard length monkey bars. Slick metal slides became injection molded primary colored plastic. It was the era of posts and platform. The kids set playground. Cities had settled on legally defensible strategies that worked. There's always a chance we're going to get sued. We need to be able to show that we've been reasonable and prudent. Defending against a lawsuit meant showing that you followed best practice and that you weren't negligent. The first part of the play was simple, safety in numbers. It was hard to sue a city for a playground feature that existed in a thousand other cities. We're certainly not doing anything weird here. Playgrounds became a commodity where you converted cash into a collection of pieces that click together like Lego. This let you buy safety out of the box. By using common manufactured components, you'd get an automatic consensus standard. But the initial equipment was only part of the picture. Playgrounds break, and when they do, they often become extremely dangerous. The equipment manufacturers were happy to help here too, sponsoring safety inspection organizations to not just sign off on new builds using their equipment, but also to inspect them regularly and ensure that bolts didn't experience no nut Novembers. They created consensus standards for the industry for padding, heights, and materials. This squeezed play spaces into a safe sameishness. Standing out in a playground sense had become cause for concern. Playground safety had morphed into playing it safe. So there you go, it's safety, right? A bunch of corporations captured the regulators to sell kids at playgrounds. No, I mean a bit, but no, it's something else. But before something else, here's something else. A word from our sponsor, me. I started a business, Fitty Host. After doing a video on the Fediverse a while back, I went to start a PeerTube instance with some others to not have all our eggs in the YouTube basket, but I found it like really hard. Luckily for me, I have these very talented friends who went and they helped me get set up. And after we did it, we were like, well, why don't we do this for other people? What's come out the other end is easy to use and actually really affordable as well. So if you're a business, a club, a group of friends, family, or even just a curious individual, as I once was, head on over to fittyhost.co and use the offer code. Beige's videos get demonetized for child injury jokes, but at least I can help him by doing this to get federated today. Now, where were we? Oh yeah, the sad safety dark ages and a regulatory consensus captured by corporations. 
So for a long time, people had been questioning the safety goal, but more in the kids these days, something something, they're all pussies sense. But chalk one up to grandpa, he had a point. Kind of. There was a growing realization that risk in play is fine, or even good. It was the unknown hazards that were the problem. During the safety era, where playgrounds were pilfered of all adrenaline, skate parks, often right beside them, were taking off. Literally. A whole generation of kick-flipping kids were cracking bones and skin and knees. At a good skate park, you can see where the consensus started to shift on risk. This looks like you could be hurt, and you absolutely can, but if you actually look closely at the design, the amount of risk is carefully constrained. You can't actually fall a long distance, and it's surrounded by cars, but planters and slopes are set up to catch a loose skateboard so skaters don't run off into traffic chasing it. I'm sure that there have been many chipped teeth and bruises here, but tellingly, when a skater died last year, it was down the road, not here. This is actually a low hazard zone. No drunk drivers, no hidden surprises. This is where thousands of local kids learn how to handle risk, face their fears, grow their confidence, and have a lot of fun. Back in the playground, the case for safe wasn't getting any better. Despite enormous enlainments, children were still getting hurt because kids seek risk. Climbing on top of structures they weren't supposed to be on, sliding on top of the enclosed slide, and even worse, thrill-seeking kids ended up in places they were never meant to be. It's one of those they're gonna do it anyway situations. It was better to have them in the risky backyard than the risky woods. As academia, parents, and pediatric associations started to push back on safe play, New Zealand was well positioned for the reversal. This little country invented and commercialized bungee jumping, jet boating, canyon swings, and zorbing. It benefits from the backing of a no-fault compensation system. In short, lawsuits for personal injury aren't a thing there. Consequently, New Zealand had always retained a stock of risky playgrounds for the refined rascal through all of this, and was rearing to restart the edgy engines, just, you know, to feel something. New Zealand was also not exclusively attached to the American playground ecosystem. It was getting its gear and standards from Europe as well. And Europe never fell to the lows of North America. Because these kits were being imported, companies started to mod them and even make stuff themselves. Liberating laws and inherent isolation created a sort of Galapagos effect. A risky renaissance took hold. In Hobsonville, a giant bird slide crapped kids onto their coccyx so hard that they headed to the hospital. But because locals loved their slide, New Zealand laws gave them a chance to fix it, and it was back in action after some minor modifications. Another slide in Henderson designed to, quote, bounce kids against the sides needed to be reworked after attracting too many dads. A series of competitive swinging teenagers set new records for what to do all weekend in Napier, and in Wellington, they just said, fuck it, and built a tower for kids to jump into the harbour, as long as they didn't do a belly flop. The largest destination playground in the Southern Hemisphere was constructed in Christchurch. Suck it, Argentina. And Heyman Park Playground was just recently finished in Manukau. Three stories high with dual flying foxes, merry-go-rounds, and the seesaw is back too, on the third level of a playground. New regulations in neighbouring Australia asked playground builders to consider the benefits of risk. New Zealand artist Mike Hewson delivered a series of risky playgrounds in Sydney and Melbourne, which look dangerous, but are deceptively safe. The stone pavers, they're actually made of rubber. The wheels and the rocks, cosmetic. It's all welded together. The playground in Melbourne's South Bank was part of a $44 million program to improve public space. And this is the reality. Although safety got us here, it's costs that are keeping us. Awesome, safe, custom playgrounds with all the bells and whistles are not only possible in North America, they exist. New playgrounds in my neighborhood, like this one, are notably better than what they replaced. But how? How did they get around those lawsuits? Well, remember, in court, playground owners just needed to show that they had been reasonable and prudent. In North America, the consensus standard was changing because just like New Zealand, what is reasonable had become more risky. The Canadian Pediatric Society and Canadian Public Health Association both stated that acceptable risk should be a part of play. So a defense lawyer now has this in their arsenal when taken to court. But the biggest factor is the money. If you're willing to spend money, you can make a playground that is awesome and safe enough to avoid lawsuits. This is the gathering place in Tulsa. It is amazing. 66 acres of towers, slides, and activities. But here's the thing. It was a gift to the city from local billionaires. It is the largest public park ever built with private funds, amounting to $465 million. 
Landscape architects have threaded the safety needle by hiring in-house playground inspectors, knowing the safety standards, pushing for change, and designing things from the start to pass a third-party safety sign-off. It's a process, but the industry worldwide has found an escape from boring playgrounds. It just costs more. Canada is not building these Canadian tire playgrounds for safety, it's building them because of a deep level of cheapness. The kit set playground is as cheap as a playground can be. Off the shelf, mass manufactured components ready to be assembled anywhere in the country. You still see kit set playgrounds everywhere in New Zealand, in schools, because the Ministry of Education has a very minimal budget for playgrounds. This truly is a Canadian tire playground from top to bottom. Hemisphere climber, $10,000. Bow ladder connector, $5,000. Double wide ramp with guardrails, 10 times, $100,000. And then it gets even cheaper because a corporation will pick up most of the bill as a public relations exercise. All you have to do is plaster the lands of your nation with branding. Let's get building. It's almost an exact parallel to another difference that you notice when walking around Australasia. Another thing where North America has decided to abdicate its responsibility and hand things over to the private sector. Almost every park you go to in New Zealand, you'll also find a public toilet. In North America, this is a public toilet. Or this. And we've even tried the public relations route of getting toilets to be paid for by advertisers. There's no way to get around it. Building and maintaining playgrounds and public toilets is simply expensive. When you see an awesome public playground with toilets beside it, that society decided investing in public spaces and families is important. When you're sheltering your daughter with a towel while she pisses in a bush beside a Canadian tire playground, that's Canada. It didn't used to be like this and it doesn't have to stay this way. There is now a once in a generation opportunity to fix this. The shift from safety unleashed something special. Bespoke landscape architects did this BMX pump track in Auckland, so they happily play in the risky water of the new era. But recently they've been taking a different type of risk, one that didn't really cost much more than this generic set of playground assets. The Warrior Mountain play space relates to a specific story that tells a love story between yeah. the three mountains. They have done a series of playgrounds that all tap into local history and culture. The design are all specifically relating to the community. Developed with local indigenous groups and artists. All the patterns that you've seen on the ground in the Warrior Mountain play space, they were all provided by a local artist. The artwork was actually integrated into the play space. Mm. There's actually a very practical reason for doing it like this. It does contribute to possibly a little bit more social discipline. You know, like it's not acceptable to go and deface something of cultural value when you yeah. live in a cultural community. And you have to wonder, are we really saving money with these playgrounds when you factor in maintenance? Yellowknife's Canadian Tire Playground was tagged with protest slogans on its first day and has been struggling with vandalism and repairs ever since. I mean, if they get defaced, what do you expect? You know, you haven't talked to the community, you haven't engaged with them, you're just putting something there that you expect people to play on because it's a swing. At the root of the Canadian Tire Playground is a misalignment of motivations. A city and a sponsor wouldn't design the same playground even with the same budget. When you design a playground, you want to do it with maintenance in mind. When you're designing a playground to have a big flashy, wow, we built a playground and not for what it's going to be like in 10 years, you run into problems. You don't need to invest millions of dollars. So you could provide a landscape environment incorporating design and art without even having a swing or a slide or anything like that. In Canada, similar realizations have been happening. Why did we spend so long seeing a playground as a slide and a set of swings? It can be a way to get fit, a way to learn music, a piece of public art, and when done right, all of the above. A music-inspired park in Toronto features a slide designed by a local artist, Kwame Delfish working with the firm Earthscape to turn a sculpture into a safe play structure. Earthscape have made a name for themselves creating beautiful wood structures that add more value to a community than just something for kids to play on. But even traditional kit set manufacturers have a role in the Renaissance, building hardy components like outdoor musical instruments. In Myers Park in Auckland, where I first became intrigued by all this, snails and birds and other creations dot the landscape playful shoots and pipes to experiment with physics. I realized that none of this stuff was dangerous or super expensive. It was just fun and creative and beautiful. And the first steps in making this caliber of playground a national standard exists right here in Canada. To Vancouver! This giant spinning chandelier sits under a bridge downtown. 
It's a $4.8 million piece of public art, paid for because the developers of a neighboring building had to make a community amenity contribution to public art funding. This building's big price meant a big piece of art. A few blocks away is Rainbow Park. It is as good as anything in New Zealand. Is it a park? Is it a playground? Is it architecture? Is it art? Who knows? But the kids love it. Rainbow Park was also funded by community amenity contributions, largely from some towers nearby built by Canadian oligarchs. Recently, the city of Vancouver has stopped doing these case-by-case -case art contributions. They've merged funding inputs into one predictable fixed-rate system. Public art, public parks, public amenities are all this one simple fee. It's the perfect time to also merge funding outputs. Artists and architects should be working closely to create higher value public spaces that integrate lots of neighborhood needs at once. In New Zealand, this philosophy of integration and art isn't just creating nice playgrounds, it's creating resilient, useful public spaces from top to toilet. Yeah, they're more like a sculpture than a toilet. So again, if you didn't know what they were, you'd probably just think it was a piece of art. Often you'll hear people in North America say, this is why we can't have nice things when they see some vandalism of a public space. But the truth is the reason we can't have nice things is because of decisions that we make. Do you think New Zealand doesn't have teenagers and homeless people? This nice stuff gets damaged all the time. The city planned for it by designing stuff from the start to be less likely to be vandalized, and when it does, they fix it. Canada didn't have homeless people swarming its downtowns in the 1990s, yet it still didn't build public toilets and boutique parks. Right now, the housing boom has given Canadians a once in a century influx of cash in the form of development fees to build out our public spaces. So when the construction boom is over in a couple of decades, and the development fees all spent, what sort of mark will we be leaving on Canada? In New York, one last fucking <laughs> Fucking hell. It can be a way to get fit. A way to fuck you. <laughs> We're certainly not doing anything weird here. <laughs> Shit. OK. You OK? Yeah, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> and ensure that bolts didn't experience no nut Novembers. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Ow! Anywhere in the country. Ow! <laughs> Something like that. Ouch. <laughs> Ow, my <right> rear. <laughs> yeah. Sliding on top of the enclosed slide. <laughs> Ouch. Ow. As academics, pediatric associations and parents. As academia, parents and pediatric associations. It's pretty intense. New Zealand was well positioned for the rehearsal. As academia, parents and pediatric associations started to push back on safe play, New Zealand was well positioned for the rehearsal. Rehearsal, fuck. Slick middle slides became in Are we really saving money when you're out. <laughs> you can hear the safety. Been so long, seeing a playground as a slide in a set of six. Bow ladder connector. Five thousand dollars. <laughs> it's not a problem. Now where were we? <laughs> the value of injury or loss of life with children is so high because they <laughs> Burger King playground delivered a whopper twenty million dollar payout. <laughs> I think it's really, really safe. Unless you go with someone you don't like, I think you'd be pretty safe. <laughs>